Hi, I'm Liz Pruitt, and you're listening to Ingredient Insiders. This is Ingredient Insiders. I'm John Magazzino. And I'm Andrea Parkins. On each episode of Ingredient Insiders, we will be talking with chefs and famous cookbook writers about their favorite ingredients. We then speak to the producers of those ingredients. We learn about their history, how they're made, and why chefs love using them in their kitchens. Today, we are talking about honey, and I am so excited to do this because it's such a fascinating ingredient. It really is. I mean, you're talking about an ingredient that's coming from bee pollination and has been, you know, goes back almost to the start of, you know, human time. Yeah. When you talk about, like, it's a huge, think about all of the honey that's consumed around the world every day in tea, in desserts, pastry, drizzled every which way. And it's all thanks to bees. Yeah. I, I mean, there are so many different types of honey. There's chestnut, there's acacia, wildflower, clover. They all have different flavor profiles and colors. Chefs are using them in a variety of ways. Um, you know, we're seeing them now even in cocktails and mocktails. You know, the flavor pro- profiles are going to change recipes. It's just an incredible ingredient. Now, Andrew, I've been seeing headlines about bees and colony collapse and that they're, you know, are they disappearing or are they not disappearing? Should we be eating honey still? Like, what's the story? Absolutely. I mean, you know, honey's not going, going anywhere, but there is... Um, a lot of signs of colony collapse right now. So we do have to, you know, be cognizant and do what we can as a as a world to protect bees so we can protect honey for all the generations to come. But I'm still okay to be buying honey Absolutely. and putting it in my tea. Okay, Absolutely. great. Well, we're also, we're going to be speaking with Liz Pruitt, a legend, legend, literally the founder and creator of Tartine Bakery in San Francisco and now Los Angeles, um, you know, without any exaggeration, one of the greatest pastry chefs, bakers to ever grace the planet. Absolutely. She's a mentor to so many. Her books are absolutely beautiful. Um, A lot of pastry chefs use them and study them for their recipes. So I cannot wait. I was so excited when she said she wanted to talk about honey. And here we are in San Francisco, in her town, ready to speak to her. I cannot wait to talk to Liz Pruitt from Tartine. And then we're going to be talking to Ted Dinnard from the Savannah Bee Company in Savannah, Georgia. And he is a bee expert. He actually has his own hives, Mm -hmm. makes his own honey, and then also buys honey from all over the world, I believe. Absolutely. Yeah. He's been a beekeeper for over 40 years, a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience. So I can't wait to learn from Ted and from Liz all about honey on this episode, John. The honey episode. How fun is this going to be? How sweet it is. Ah, very, very cute. Very nice. This episode is in partnership with The Chef's Warehouse and produced by Gotham Production Studios in New York City. This is definitely the greatest guest ever. Yes. Because (laughs) for two reasons. One, she brought notes. (laughs) And? And she brought honey. And And she brought like... Wait, like her like chopsticks for everybody. Yeah, we're, this we're, is amazing. Yeah, this and not to mention the fact that she is a legend uh, in the world of baking and pastries. Um, we are. It's a very a vast understatement to say that we are honored that you're here, Liz Pruitt of Tartine. And uh, you know, it's interesting, Andrea. You know, we're New Yorkers, mm-hmm. and Andrea had never had any Tartine pastries before. So John was running late this morning and I'm like, where I is he? Because I stopped at the manufactory to buy a few things for Andrea and the crew. And Andrea took a bite of her first morning bun. <laughs> and I loved watching <laughs> That's the whole a good thing. first. Oh, it was, I mean, amazing. Just the cinnamon, the sugar, the, the butteriness, the richness. Oh, it was... Orange. Spectacular. Oh, yeah. Yes. The crusty the flaky. and the soft on the inside. Yeah. I just like layer by layer, I was just peeling. It was My so nice. My first tartine memory goes back many years. You guys are celebrating, congratulations, 20 years now. We opened in 2002. Wow. 20 years. But I remember a friend of mine who lived in the Bay Area was like, oh my God, you got to try this bread. You got to try the, you know, the pastries. And, the ba- and I went in there and I just saw a ham and cheese croissant. And I was like, let me have one of those. And my mind was blown. So good. So good. Thank you. 
But so, today we're yeah, talking today, all about honey. We're going to talk about honey, but let's go. Let's jump back twenty years of history. Let's not to be okay. Uh, we'll go with history know, first. Not to be then we'll get into honey. Liz, you're f- you're not originally from the Bay Area. I'm from Brooklyn. Okay, a New Yorker, another nice. New Yorker in the mm-hmm. house. Love it. Yeah. And you know, having read the Tartine books over the years, um, I know that you traveled all over Europe. That you guys learned your trade there. Um, How did you become the baker that you are? Well, I would say it would have to start prior to that with my family, like, you know, cooking and baking does with so many families. I think especially baking, you know, families just, you you start as a young kid baking with your parents. Uh, And both of my parents were great bakers. Um, My father loves baking. He, in fact, won the grandma's molasses um, gingerbread contest of like 1978 or something like that's awesome (laughs) okay so all right so there's a lineage here yeah 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 yeah. he won one of those national contests Mm -hmm. he made a fairy out of gingerbread and i remember he he cast the gingerbread over like a really big le creuset or something Mm -hmm. you know one of those big um oval ones and he He's not a trained at whatsoever, but he spun caramelized sugar around the paddle what? wheels. It was a paddle wheel, like Mississippi River boat. That's awesome. What did your dad do for a living? A art director of an ad agency uh, all incredible. through the 60s and 70s and 80s. So you remember baking with your dad and, and just like kind More of... More with my mom and okay. my grandma, but my father had his artistic influence and, and he he himself studied art in Japan. He was an army brat and he... He studied there and, you know, creative director at ad agencies. Um, and this, this was his uh, combination of all that creativity with, uh, with cooking and baking. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So Tartine opens 20 years ago. Did you ever imagine, you know, 20 years later, the success, the, you know, w- what it represents to you know, pastries and bakeries in America. I mean, it, it is as big a, a success story as any. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I don't think anybody when they're just studying and learning their craft and we were so specific in what we wanted to learn. Um, you know, of course, Chad's the bread baker and my area was, was pastry. And we went to culinary school. That's where we met. We went to France. We lived there almost a year and worked in the Haute Savoie and um, in the, the VAR region. Um, spent very, really just days in Paris, but the days we had, we went to every bakery that we could find, but it was very traditional bakery um, experience that we were getting. And that's how we started. We, you know, many people were asking us, are you gonna make you know, cheesecakes and muffins and cupcakes? Um, when we first opened, but we were still kind of coming off this European trip. And those were the things that we wanted to start with. And of course, we introduced lots of other things. And we do make cheesecake now. (laughs) I mean, the thing that strikes me when you hear the story, your guys' story too, is that especially in an era of like instant gratification and a lot of young chefs going to culinary school and coming out and wanting to run their own restaurants and think that, you know, oh, I'll go work at a restaurant, I'll work there for a year, and then I'm ready to like take on the world. When you read about the history of, of yourself and Chad, it's like, you guys, you mentioned you went to Europe for a year. You guys were also in the Berkshire Mountains mm-hmm. baking, and then you came out here. And you didn't just come to San Francisco, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys were up near like Point Reyes, baking out of your house more or less, going to the farmer's markets, Mm -hmm. selling your stuff for years. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's where we landed when we came back from Europe. Um, We knew the oven builder, Alan Scott, who is infamous at this point. Alan has passed, but um, he was just an incredible, um, uh, well, he was a metalsmith, but he created this um, method of building uh, wood-fired ovens. And that is what Chad trained on in, in Europe, and that's what we wanted to follow through on. 
And then I learned how to bake with the residual heat, which is, of course, what pastry chefs do. Um, and so after he was done with the bread, I would do my cakes and pastries and really started with galettes. I, I think that was like the big, um, the thing that most interested me at the time because we also had these incredible farmers markets and I would uh, pack our van up and uh, leave Chad and the cats behind and we would I would just go to the markets. And at that time we were selling in Berkeley um, and at the Temescala market. And at the end of the market, I would just like buy everything for the next day. And it was just really lovely, easy um, kind of rhythm, baking rhythm that we got into. Point Reyes happens to be very cool, of course, most of the year, in fact, um, with good humidity. Uh, we couldn't afford a lot uh, equipment wise. He was mixing by hand. I did not have a large mixer. Actually, everything was mixed by hand pretty much. Um, and I loved the process of lamination to make the, I wasn't making puff pastry, but I was making a very laminated um, uh, pastry to make the galettes with. And so that's, that's where we started. And the, and the brick oven just holds so much residual heat that you get a beautiful lift with really any pastry um, like that. So You have fond memories of those years of going very, to the farmer's market? I mean, I think we was, all do once we get to this point of, you know, we, we have more than one store. And um, we've written a few books. And, you, you, of course, you look back and you think, you know, just like all of our lives, how simple it was then, how satisfied yeah. we were with like a good farmer's market day of course when i was selling it was during el nino it wasn't all easy uh by any uh stretch of the imagination it was really hard it was just pouring rain and wind constantly um in those years but uh yeah it was it was a wonderful life well one of yeah. the thing that uh, you know things that's important to anybody in business is scaling and, and growing the business and I, I that's the one thing that to me I was never lucky enough to go enjoy your galettes from the farmer's market, but the business has grown and grown, and yet the quality is still, I, I can't see it being any better. I mean, it's the benefit of building the foundation that we that we did yeah. and going really slowly. I mean, we really went slowly. We were just going to dinner one night at Delfina and we saw this corner spot and we didn't have much money and we somehow like got together the funds to open it and that's all we thought we would be doing really. Um, and fortunately we, we found footing with the community and people liked what we did. So yeah, I mean you talked about that. like writing a few cookbooks and I think mm -hmm. they've become the Bible for many people and a lot of aspiring chefs. I on the plane ride out here in preparation for uh, another interview with Sarah Minnick, mm -hmm. um, the yep. new chef table. I don't know if you've seen the episode, but she has the the bread book, and it looks as if um, the cover's tattered. It is and so tattered. Apart. Like, I love that so much. So she said that she's actually read it to like 200 times. Oh my gosh! And that's where she learned her craft was from that book. So your influence is just it's oh, that's incredible so great to hear. I love yeah. hearing that. Yeah. So I, I, are we ready? I'm like really excited. Oh yeah, well I want to. Yeah, you know it's funny because I have. It's open. We I have jet lag being here in California, <laughs> and this morning I was up at four o'clock in the morning, just thinking about this conversation with Liz, and I was like, again that idea of it. This didn't happen overnight. This was years of work for other people learning that whole process, and then it was being on your own, as you mentioned, up in Point Reyes and getting in the van and going to the farmer's market and years and years. And I, then I was like, we're going to be talking about honey. And there's this analogy almost of like bees flying around and it just doesn't happen quickly. And it's a process of like mm. gathering mm -hmm. nectar and, uh, you know, anyhow, that's my silly little like thing that happened at four o'clock in the morning. I was like, I think there's this like great, Thing about the dedication of a bee, yeah, and the dedication. One, the and maybe that's, that's her whole. Liz, I, Liz maybe is the queen bee of. Uh, I love that of baking because, you know, she's looking over a very large hive now with the tartine business. Let's talk about honey though, because okay. 
Why did you want to it's, talk about it's it? It's funny. Today? She knew right out of the gate. Yeah. A lot of chefs are like, I don't know what I want to talk about. I, and they think about it. And she was like, can we talk about honey? I was like, I didn't even have to think about it. Yeah. I mean, the moment you said, it, I thought, hmm, what, hmm, what, what, what is an ingredient, honey? And there's like so much. And I too have laid awake early in the morning and late at night thinking about this because the more research I did, because I really wanted to find out a little bit more of the history. Of course, I know, I, I love to know the tasting notes and what you can cook and bake with it, but the deep history that honey has, it's like one of the, well, probably, definitely, the first sweetener of civilization. Um, it's where, it's what they think is the first fermented drink. Uh, it was mead, or mm -hmm. mead, mead type of drinks were uh, simply water mixed with honey collects the yeast and the bacteria from the air and the people who are making it. Um, and that was the first alcoholic beverage. Uh, honey has been, little pots of honey and mead have been found in Egyptian tombs. It was so highly considered and valued that it was traded, of course, up and down the spice route, but to be buried uh, in a pyramid I think it's medicinal oh. purposes as well. All yeah, stuff. you can put it it's on like wounds. a huge yeah. topic. All these things for health come up with honey. Um, besides, of course, the, you know, the sweetened vinegar sauce that I was originally yeah. thinking of. Um, yeah, it's used in, you know, as a cough suppressant. Um, topically, it's used for, it comes up again and again in my reading um, for eye problems, eye sores, wound healing. Yep. Honey has hydrogen peroxide in it. I didn't know this. This is a component um, of honey that helps keep it. People have allergies, I think, also by taking honey. Like the local, honey. if you have like yeah. local honey in, from your yes. area, yeah. mm -hmm. it helps with allergies. Yeah, I've, yeah. Got, yep. I've, yes, I've read about that too. Um, and again, talking about my parents, when we moved, we moved from Brooklyn to Garrison, New York, upstate, and they just like, with a vengeance, went back to the land. And this was the late 70s. And my dad started to keep bees. And we had goats and ducks. And my mother gardened every inch of our property. But my dad kept bees. Um, and well, so my mother also is allergic to bees. But she did bee sting therapy. Um, because there was just like so many bees around. So many bees around. I'm, de I'm, I'm definitely scared. <laughs> For of my bees. life, I have to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm terrified and it of worked. bees. Uh, to this day, she she's not allergic to bees anymore. Wait, so how did that work? What did she do? She went to a doctor for it, but it was bee sting therapy, and you literally get like very very tiny doses of it, and you build up um, doses. Uh, to create your own body's I, immunity. Like getting like allergy I, shots or whatever, like if you're allergic to like dogs do or cats or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. She, she was dedicated to that marriage yeah. because if Lauren said, I'm going to start getting beehives, which yes. she's actually hinted about, I'm like, and she, I love honey, but keep those bees away from me, please. Right, right. But I think like the you sent me an article this morning, I think at four o'clock in the morning when you were awake and I woke up and read it. And I was so kind of taken back the life cycle of a bee. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible life. Like, Bees, you know, they essentially, you know, you have the one queen, the, the males, you know, once they, you know, reproduce, they, they die. And then when the queen has done, you know, finished with her job, they, her daughters kill her. So like, it's this like- It sounds brutal. It was like really dark <laughs> for my first reading just, of the I morning. Like, I, I were, this is just it's like mind boggling that, Liz and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, like- it takes it's these are insects that this is also a multi-billion dollar industry around the world and we'll talk about like mm -hmm. things that go on in that yes but like the fate of humanity having honey which so many people covet comes down to a tiny flying insect it's even more than honey though it's like everything you know they're pollinating oh, the flowers and, like, and everything this is why is about it bees. cannot be underscored enough right that we have to take care of our bees yep. and, yeah. and make sure that we're still growing things for them to pollinate. But it's a serious problem right now, this bees, right? This hive collapse thing is a real yeah. issue. Yeah. I've, I've read about people who are trying to create programs. A friend of mine is the CEO of the Pittsburgh airport, Christina Casotas, and she at the airport has, um, of course they have 
as all airports do, tons of land. So she was giving the land over that's never used yeah. Yeah. to local bee farmers. So they bring the the boxes are called yeah. supers. They bring the supers in, and uh, this in turn helps you know the local population to be pollinated. Yeah, that's really that, cool. All, the only thing I know about the hive collapse stuff is the headlines I see on NPR, and it it sounds very grim. Yes, because of that too, I wanted to say like honey should really be thought of something like um, saffron or caviar, all of these things that are precious and take a tremendous amount of work to create at one time. Obviously, it was plentiful, um, but you touched on something. It is a huge industry, and where you have a huge industry and so much financial weight behind it, there's going to be a lot of fraud. And, and actually, uh, honey is it's one of the top three or four fraudulently made foodstuffs. How does someone know when they're getting real pure honey versus cheating honey does it does, do we know how to tell the difference as a consumer right as a consumer i would make sure that you purchase from a, a smaller store that has you know the labeling should actually say where your honey's coming from i won't call out any specific names but i would say large supermarket chains that have their own label on it i would be suspect of so buyer um, beware and not only that, you know, there's there's the fraudulent aspect, but you're also getting honeys that have been brought in from all over the world and blended. And so you have something that is like, um, well, like freeze dried coffee, for instance. It's kind of just like brown sludge from, you know, beans from around the world and probably all sorts of other stuff. It's sort of the equivalent. Whereas if you get, I brought some honeys today that are in front of us. If you get a honey from a specific area, from a farmer that is on the label, you know that that's from a specific place. And that's really what you want to look for. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing that, uh, you know, a lot of folks may think honey is honey. There are so many different varieties, mm -hmm. taste profiles. A lot of it has to do with the flowers that, right. you know, what the bees are yeah, whatever feeding on, whatever nectar. Yeah, that's what the honey tastes like. Exactly. So the, the nectar that they're collecting um, is what is going to determine the end result in the taste. And uh, well, like wine as well, you have a terroir, terroir from where the honey was collected, even just like on the coast and also depending on the time of year, um, some honeys are collected in the spring, some in the fall, and you have completely different flavor profiles and it's just so interesting and also the other benefit is if you go to a smaller producer go to a farmer's market and they always have tasters and we're, we're going to do some tasting today and you'll want to go from like the lightest honey flavor and usually the color not always but usually the color will uh, reflect the lighter flavor the lighter color the lighter flavor and deeper etc um and it's just so interesting and there's like a little bit of a methodology to tasting as well. You can determine like if you're just using it in your tea or some people like it in their coffee too or in baking um, or of course on your toast then you really get that pure honey flavor. How does honey uh, find its way into your baking products? Is it it's not is it interchangeable with sugar? Is it It's not you know? inter no, it's not interchangeable. Um, but you can Often when I'm baking with honey, I won't use all honey as a substitute. I'll use part sugar, part honey because, uh, well, for one thing, it when you're baking with honey, you want to lower your oven temperature because it's going to brown faster. Usually by about 25 degrees, you want to lower your oven temperature by. Also, if you're using honey as a substitute for sugar, which you certainly can in recipes, either all or part, you want to use less honey. It's probably uh, a third less. So if your recipe calls for one cup of honey, use two thirds, or sorry, one cup of sugar, you would use two thirds cup of honey. And also you would want to decrease the amount of moisture in it because honey has around 20% um, depending on the honey, but that's like an, an average. Honey is also acidic, so you're to counteract the acidity, you're gonna add a little bit of baking soda. And I have, uh, I think it's 
the specific amount is, I believe it's about a quarter of a teaspoon per half cup uh, of honey used for a baking soda. When I think of honey in desserts, my mind shifts towards Aquabar. very you know, Mediterranean, yeah, Greece mm -hmm. and Eastern Europe and Turkey and Syria and... Mm -hmm. and this I think like honey with baking, I was just thinking a little like back to the sugar versus honey, like sugar doesn't have, I'm going to use the word terroir, mm -hmm. but like honey does. So you're oh, going to yeah. get those notes mm -hmm. that you wouldn't get from using sugar. I, I, I mean, I don't typically bake with honey, but I think I want to try yeah, to see what it will do to the outcome. Yeah. There's, I mean, there, we're going to do the tasting in a few minutes, but there's some honeys that I... One thing, an example, chestnut honey from Italy, mm. there's a time and a place for it. I don't necessarily say I love that honey. It's such an intensity of flavor. Very strong. And bitterness and strong. And Do do your uh, baking forays ever go into Mediterranean, Eastern European things? Yeah, so Middle Eastern, yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you ever get into that? Because, you know, whenever, again, whenever I go into tartine, I'm looking at those tried and true classics that I love. Yeah. And unfortunately, I only get out here a couple times a year, so I don't get to see if you're doing anything special or different. Well, I have to preface this by saying I'm gluten intolerant. And so things that rely on, like baklava, you were saying, it's really all about the phyllo pastry. Um, and so, no, we haven't made baklava at the, at the bakery, but that is a really good example of a pastry that uses honey and a honey that you would really get the clear honey flavor because it's all about the nuts and the honey and the crunch of that neutral kind of um, uh, pastry that it's made with. It's and like a honey syrup. That's how I. So think you're making of it. a honey yeah. syrup and you're pouring it over once the baklava are baked, and so it really it just seeps in. Uh, oh gosh, it just reminds me of living in Brooklyn and going to Atlantic Avenue when I was a kid and there were just huge trays of beautiful baklava out um, on the counters of these Middle Eastern um, food purveyors. And that is a great example. There's also um, in Northern Africa um, something called uh, tamina that is made with uh, steamed toasted semolina and honey syrup and it's it's sort of like a porridgey consistency it's mixed and and you pour it out and it's kind of flat like a quarter of an inch uh to half an inch thick and that too is decorated usually with uh, some cinnamon and nuts um and so you find i can't think of a place in all of my research where i'm not finding honey I mean, I, um, I, I'm Jewish, and you know, for oh, for me, you Rosh know, Rosh Hashanah, like yep. apples and honey, it apples was and honey, like yep. you know, I grew up with and have very, very young, fond memories of. That's you know, right. Yeah. It's the welcome to the, the new year. New year. Exactly. When you were talking about the, like uh, the the baklava, I immediately mm -hmm. went to like rose water, orange blossom water. Like I associate that with honey as well. Like those. I don't know. It's interesting you brought that up, too, because my a friend of mine, Claire Patak, who owns Violet Bakery in London, has a wonderful recipe for rose water and honey madeleines. Oh. And all of these things that I'm mentioning, you can look up, mm -hmm. uh, you can Google. Uh, that recipe is published. Um, I would be remiss in not mentioning Michelle Polzine's infamous, at this point, uh, Russian honey cake that she popularized at her now closed 20th uh, Century Cafe. Um, that is easily found on the internet as well, fortunately for all of us, because she kept it very close to the vest, that recipe, for a long time. And it's an absolutely beautiful cake of 10 layers um, and just filled with, with honey. If you want to talk about this, great. If you don't, you mentioned that you're gluten intolerant. Mm -hmm. When did you find that out? Mid-career? Right around culinary, right before culinary school. I think I found out in like 86 or 7. And it was just really sad. Uh, it was really <laughs> sad. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I mean, and it's your life's work. It Luton. is. It is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I have, as part of my life's work, um, concentrated on gluten-free baking. 
And so I, I do hear all about this. Well, I brought some recipes. I developed uh, a recipe for buckwheat and honey madeleines that are so delicious. A lot of pastries really work very, very well on low gluten to no gluten flour. Um, because like cakes, and in fact, cake flour itself is made and created to be low gluten. For breads, like I was never able to eat our breads really, um, even though they're well fermented and I could tolerate them a lot more. So if you have an intolerance, try either making or finding very, very well fermented bread and you'll be able to digest that. Um, but for pastries, things like uh, shortbread benefit from, you know, rice flour, really. Um, sometimes you'll just find, even in regular gluten-filled recipes, rice flour and other very starchy cornstarch, tapioca starch, to create that more sandy kind of um, texture. Kind of texture, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being here. This has been incredible. Incredible. It was thank my you. pleasure. Wait, oh, Andrea always loves oh, to ask this okay. question. How could I even forget? I know. Go right. ahead. This is a great, I can't wait for these answers. Yeah, I'm really excited. So I I'm assuming you cook at home. Mm -hmm. What are your five top pantry staple must-haves at all times? At all times. Must have lemons. Lemons. Must have good salt. Salt. Must have Excellent olive oil. Mm -hmm. Wait, how many? Three? Three. Um, and if you did like more than five, it's fine. Okay. Um, can I say the obvious one? <laughs> it's a must have honey. <laughs> um, <laughs> pepper flakes. Yeah. For any kind of like. That's on my list. Paprika, Absolutely. like anything. Like Do that, you yeah. cook a lot of savory? I'm sure. You, I mean, yeah, I, I bet I you're. I mostly cook savory, yeah. in fact. And. Can I mention like a few savory please. things? Yes, please. Please. Because we didn't even talk about honey for savory. We didn't talk about yeah. savory. So let's keep going. All right. One of the big, and I yeah. won't get too specific, but like barbecue sauces mm -hmm. with a honey in it just adds so much character, uh, so much more than just sugar. Um, we also have, oh, glazed carrots. If you ever make glazed carrots with butter and you boil the carrots down with a little, little bit of, Put a little bit of honey in there, and you'll just get a beautiful glazed uh, Love that. honey mm -hmm. carrot. In Christina Cho's book, she has a recipe for char siu pork. Um, there's also cocktails. Make, oh, instead, of, go there, instead yeah. of sugar syrup, make a syrup of honey, two parts honey, one part water, and make a margarita with it. Make, you know, the popular one is bee's knees. You can make uh, whiskey sour, really anything. But the honey adds such a fantastic flavor to cocktails. I've been into um, honey lattes. Like, honey is latte. that in your coffee? Yeah. Honey. Yeah, I know a lot of people They're love really honey good. in their I've heard coffee. about this lately. It like adds, again, like a depth of flavor that you're, you know, and I'm not, I don't put sugar in my coffee typically, but a honey latte to me is different because yeah. it has flavor. It would actually be really interesting to try coffee with all these yes. different honeys, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now, now we're done. All right, now we're done, Liz. We've got to go. <laughs> um, thank you again. This has been fascinating, informative, and just wonderful. Very so special. Thanks for joining thank us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having thanks. me. Thanks. All right, we are live in the studio with Ted Dinnard from the Savannah Bee Company. Ted, how are you doing? I am doing very well today. How about you guys? Pretty good. We're Ted's, great. Ted's in Savannah, Georgia. I've uh, never been to Savannah, Georgia. I Have was you? just saying to Ted, I've never been there either. We should be there right now. I would love to visit. Although I am allergic to bee stings, so I get a little nervous around bees. That's why we didn't do this. Ted, do you get then. stung by bees often? I sometimes do. I, I was working the bees on Friday and didn't get a single sting somehow. Okay, that's good. So Ted runs, he's the founder of Savannah Bee Company which is a maker of amazing artisanal honeys. Is that fair to say? It is. Uh, there is a little clarification uh, in that. In the beginning, I'd made all the honey, and I've been a beekeeper for 42 years now. And pretty early on, like for the last 15 years, I've had to rely on other beekeepers to help make the honey that we are selling because the company just grew and grew. How does someone get into becoming a beekeeper? Typically, well, first you have to be interested, right? Right, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, you get a, a you you have to, you just kind of have to apprentice with a with a beekeeper. Um, a lot of people will like I was taught by this old old beekeeper that put beehives on my family's land when I was a little kid, and uh, so. But if you're interested, you join a bee club, and then you have somebody that kind of takes you in the hives and and introduces you, and then answers all the millions of questions you have as you're starting your journey on it. Wow, I, bee club. Bee, yeah, were you ever in a bee club? I haven't. Have you? No, I'm, I told you, I'm definitely scared of. of oh right, bees. you're 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 allergic. Okay. I mean, I'm okay with them. I love I love bees. I think they're incredible creatures. It's always mind boggling to me. When you think about the fact that honey, and I'm also a honey lover, yeah. comes from a flying insect and that they have this most like intricate world, what do they call it? Communities of bees? Like the, this whole th colony, yeah. this whole world. Like around the queen, right? Like they have no idea that they're making people's tea taste better and yeah. making desserts and pastries. They're just and, like living their life. Right. They're not like an artisanal cheese maker who's right. like, you know, knows what they're doing for the satisfaction of some human to eat cheese and drink wine and have all this stuff. They're just busy as a bee <laughs> making honey. Talk to us about how do how is honey made? Because everybody everybody knows honey, and we like all honey know about comes hives. From bees. Yeah, what what's the process for making honey? So let me ask you this: What do you think bees make honey from? Okay, I think bees fly around mm -hmm. and they gather pollen from flowers, mm -hmm. and they it gets stuck on their legs, and then they go back to the hive, and then they go in their little honeycomb in the hive, like their little apartment. Yeah, and then when they go in there. They shake the pollen off the their legs, and then magically, honey's made. So wow. Okay, that, that wasn't my thought, but is that right? Partially right. So they do all of that, and that pollen okay. is is more protein than you know percentage wise than meat, more and every vitamin, a mineral, mineral, amino acid that you need. But that's not what honey comes from. So they eat that for you know the vitamins and protein. They collect nectar, which you can't see, and they have a little pre-stomach carrying tank. And they and nectar is mostly water. It's like eighty percent water, twenty percent sugars. They fly it back to the hive. They're adding enzymes while it's in that little storage tank, and then they put it back. Then they put that in the cells, fan the water out with their wings, and that's how they make the honey. Okay, so it's in their stomach that nectar. They, they regurgitate it. How do they spit it out, or do they? Yes, it up? they spit they it, out. it out. I was like, did they poop it out? They don't poop it out. Um, and if it goes to their, their real stomach, they digest it and it's used as energy. So it doesn't go into what where they're eating it. It's just into this okay. little pre-stomach thing. Well, it's a honey tank. I had no idea. Did you know that? No, I, I honestly, I was leaning towards it was some sort of like a, a waste you know, it was like a bumblebee. <laughs> well, it is. It's just, so it is, yeah. It's coming out the top, not the bottom, right. is what you're saying. Okay. Right. But it's so, not yeah, waste. Honestly, it's really so and that nectar is in the flower. It's called it's in the nectary of the flower. And the uh and the only reason for that nectary is to pay or entice a pollinator to come over and cross pollinate that flower. That's that's the whole reason that that it's that it even works. Uh and the bees in the flowering plant world have co-evolved for over a hundred million years. And, and that's, you know, that's the world that we live in. And when can you collect the honey? So I know it like it sits and there, and honey, when you talk about like a color spectrum, there's very light and then there's, you know, amber, there's dark. Yes. Is it something that has to age to get to a certain point or? Um, what fascinated me when I was a kid going through this old man's hives um, was you could pull this frame of honeycomb up and you'd hold it up against the, the sun and you'd see different colors shining through like stained glass and you'd stick your finger in the the reddish looking honey and it tasted a certain way. And then you put it in the sort of yellow or whatever you want to call it, honey. There was even a little greenish honey. Um, but yes, you can have honey of different colors and that's all determined by the, the species of flower that the bee visits. Oh, so there you go. some honeys are really dark and they do call it dark amber, and there's amber and light amber and extra light amber. and So yeah. the color of the honey has to do with the flowers that the bee was gathering the nectar from. Yes. So which what flowers are your bees pollinating? That's a good question. So 
so in the basically we sell tupelo honey that's a tupelo the flowers of a tupelo tree this tree grows in the rivers near savannah um and it, the tree will grow in these rivers between here and kind of west florida and that's where you can make this honey some beekeepers even float their beehives on barges to get up into the trees because the bees have to visit two million flowers to make one pound of honey so you wow. you that's can't crazy. have like a you know a, a little flower garden you got to have a forest of you know thousands and thousands of flowers um really millions did you, did you know that andrea is as sweet as tupelo honey <laughs> is that true andrea that, yeah that's what they say about me sweet Van as honey morrison said that yeah <laughs> that is it is uh yeah that's a great honey and that's a that's a great thing if you're as sweet as tupelo honey that's pretty daggum sweet but yeah. we also sell a sourwood honey and orange blossom honey we sell a rosemary honey from spain a lavender honey from spain uh, an acacia honey from from Hungary, we sell a, a black sage honey when it's made from Southern California. We sell a, a honey that it's it's got lots of clover and wildflowers in it from Montana that is sets up like peanut butter. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's there's it's all wildly different. I want to hear from Ted a little bit about the state of the world when it comes to bees. Yes. Yeah, so. As I mentioned, you know, it's been 100 million years in the making and uh, all of a sudden, just recently, the bees have been under major duress. And, and uh, so you, have, you mentioned colony, colony collapse disorder. There's a lot of different things that are just impacting bees adversely. And, you know, there's habitat loss. Probably the most devastating factor is the mite it was introduced into this country in the late 80s. And really since then, beekeepers have struggled to keep their bees alive and the viruses that these mites transmit just keep changing just you know, as we've just sort of all learned a little bit about viruses lately. And and they just keep knocking the bees down. So that's, I feel like if there were not the mites and the viruses that they're transmitting that we wouldn't have this colony collapse disorder. But you add that to the mix of all of these other factors and, and there's pesticides and insecticides and like a dearth of diversity in flowers and, and, and you just get, yeah, you get what a lot of declining bee population, but it's, and honeybees are kind of the gateway drug and, and as well as the, the canary in the coal mine, because they're letting you know, because people work with bees, like what's going on out there. And there are over 3000 species of native species of bees here in this country and this continent. Um, over 25,000 species worldwide. And so they've been, you know, like master gardeners shaping the world that, w that we live in for f forever. And um, and we need them. If you like to breathe or if you like to eat, you you should love your pollinators. A world without bees probably would not exist. So, like we wouldn't be true. here right now. Um, what is the life cycle of a honeybee? Like how long does a honeybee live and how much honey does a single honeybee make does anybody do, does that known yeah there's like a million interesting bee facts uh and so yes the uh one bee she they're all all worker bees are female um she will make a twelfth of a teaspoon in her lifetime um, oh my god wait, that's not a lot one bee makes a twelfth of a teaspoon yes that's that's nothing. a little bit yeah that's it's a tiny like, bit and wow. that is and there could be 80,000 worker bees in a hive, right? So, you know, you need a lot of them. So the queen lays an egg. Three weeks later, the bee hatches as an adult, gets straight to work. And then for three weeks, she's a house bee and she's doing all these little house duties. And then she, then after that, she's a field bee for three weeks. And, and by the end of that time, you know, her, she's just worn out and doesn't, and that's, that's it. But the queen is laying, she can lay, you know, up to two, 3,000 eggs every single day. So she can lay more eggs than bees are dying. And she controls the sort of expansion and contraction of the population, depending on what, what she wants to do. And, and you need to think of it not as an individual bee, but think of those individual bees more like cells of your body, where, you know, except in this case, they fly out, <laughs> collect stuff and come back and and take care of things in the hive but um that's the colony is the super organism so an individual bee can't survive on her own she has to be part of this colony wow this is like 
fascinating to me. It, and, and how far do the bees travel to go get the nectar every day? So they can, um, people say like they can go 12 miles, that they will go three miles and they, and they certainly can. And, but the, but they're not going to make a whole lot of surplus honey. So the, they need to make a ton of flower trips, like as I mentioned, to make honey. And so if you have to fly a mile and then come back, you know, you can't make as many trips. So if you stuff, if you put your beehives and trout, take them into like the middle of a clover field in North Dakota, they can just get a, go to flowers that are right nearby and just do lots and lots and lots of trips. And um, and that's how you can make a, you know, a lot of honey or they can make a lot of honey. Now, we buy from Savannah Bee Company our honeycomb. Nice. And, yes. you know, John and I talk about this a lot. You know, outside of cheese and charcuterie boards, what are some of the uses for honeycomb that you're seeing? Well, if people are, are putting them on the top of cocktails that I see mm -hmm. a lot, just kind of a garnish on the top, have it like a, a long toothpick through it, um, skewered. Uh, they, I've seen it on the rim of the glass. They're uh, very pretty. Oh, beautiful. It, it is the texture and you know, and you know, when you see it, you know what that is, right? And it's wax though, right? Can you eat it? Is it something you can chew and eat? Yes. yes right. The beeswax is completely edible. Um, it's got lots of natural vitamin A and they, mm -hmm. uh, it serves as roughage in your system. So no, it's, it's good for you. Uh, another question. So we've talked about the bees, they gather the nectar, they come back to the hive then what happens to the honey? I know you take out like those screens and kind of scrape them off. Is there processing done with honey? Is it cooked? Is it heated up? Right. You spin it. She's right. Yeah. So you take take She's the frames out. On honey. There's there's take caps it, on either the... side. Yeah. You yeah. cut the caps off. Put them in this like centrifuge. It's like a metal basket that spins around inside of a stainless steel drum and it slings the honey out. And then you do not have to do anything. You do. How you should strain it just to get like the big pieces of wax and things out mm -hmm. and particles, but uh, but you don't you don't have to do anything to it. Uh, a lot of people heat the honey because it will granulate, and so they don't they want to slow that down, and so they they heat it really hot or they'll filter it, you know, through super small little micron filters. This is fascinating. I knew it was going to be interesting, but. This has blown my mind, to be honest with you. And what strikes me out of this whole conversation is how much we take for granted every teaspoon of honey that we eat in our lives on a day. You know, on a, think of how many people, if we're in New York City right now, how much honey was stirred into a cup of teas this morning yeah. or put into pastries or drizzled on toast without anybody really giving a lot of consideration to the bees that literally took 12 bees to make that one teaspoon, yep. right? Am I doing my math right you there? It, it's mind boggling. And that's not every day. I mean, we need the bees to survive. What and can we do, Ted, to help? Or what can people who are listening do to help the bees, right? Is there things we can do or? Yeah, there, there are things. So what you could do is you could take up beekeeping. You can put out little little bowls of water um, you uh, with, with rocks or marbles in them so the bees can get get water in the summertime to cool the hive down. They do evaporative cooling in the heat that you can uh, plant a diversity of flowers, meaning like a six, something that blooms in a succession where it's not just all one and done. Um, you can not mow your yard or not mow a section, let some weeds grow up and flower. You can, there's lots of little things like that. You can put little, little native bee houses in your yard. And it's so interesting because all of a sudden they just take up residence in there. And you'll have like a little bee and they most native bees only live like by themselves or in like real small groups. And uh, they have a whole they're not these big super colonies like like honeybees. But that's a few few things. And then one last question, you know, and we're going backwards here. What's the history of honey? I mean, how long ago do they have records of people consuming honey and beekeeping honey. and stuff? Yeah. So there's these there's a there's a sort of a famous honey hunters. Actually, it's right over here. And I can't really see it, but it's uh, that. Uh, but it's uh, a, a depiction on a cave in 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 Spain where they're they're collecting honey, and I, they, it's anywhere between eight and sixteen thousand years old. They're not really sure. There are some old, old, I mean, really old records in in Africa that are honeycomb honeycombs in caves, to not necessarily honey specifically. The answer is 
since there were humans, they have found honey and have been working with it. But the bees and the and the flowering plants, if you go back, you know, a hundred and something million years, there's no bees, there's just wasps. Then some wasp changes and decides it's just going to go to flowers and eat the nectar and the pollen from a flower. And then all of a sudden, the, there's almost no flowering plants back then either. And then all of a sudden, the flowering plants start exploding and they're trying to capture the the attention of the pollinator so that it will come and carry the pollen and make them more successful and and so over you know the eons the that's you know they've developed and bees have developed and specialized and yeah and now we have this world that is amazingly but also dependent upon this symbiotic relationship between flowering plants and bees thank I mean, you so thank much you. for yes. all of this the savannah bee company I cannot wait to eat some honey, Andrea. Absolutely. I know we got to yes. send you some. I mean, there's please. So yes, much stuff. I want to taste all of them. We've got it at the chef's warehouse. I'm so excited to eat some honey. Yep. If you're interested, you can go to chefswarehouse.com and search for the Savannah Bee Company. Thanks again for your time. This has been a great conversation. I've learned. I've so learned much. so much. Thank you, Ted. Hey, you're Thanks, very Ted. welcome. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Ingredient Insiders. You can watch this episode on YouTube and see more behind the scenes content by following us on Instagram by searching at Ingredient Insiders.